because LaGrange College faculty are so focused on teaching young minds in the classroom, oftentimes we are unaware of the caliber of scholars in our midst, or we do not enough acknowledge those whose reputation goes beyond our region or our nation. John Cook is one of those scholars. I am grateful that he remains on our faculty, as should be the entire college and the LaGrange community. His work is exceptional, intellectually vigorous, and internationally known. And today, Dr. Cook will be speaking on the many religions of Portugal. Please help me welcome Dr. John Granger Cook. Celts were in Portugal from around 700 to AD to 200 AD, and along with them, some Lusitanian, they call it Lusitanian tribes. And the Lusitanian tribes built these so-called castras, which are settlements, and you can see that this is a stone house. And some of these stone houses were lived in until about uh, 200 BC, to sort of beginnings of the Roman period. And they had their own um, set of gods and goddesses. And one piece of evidence I've found for that is the fount of the idol. And in this fount of the idol, there is a, a Latin dedication to several of the Celtic Lusitanian divinities. And it's a very strange one. Ton Gonabiagas is this god's name. And apparently, it comes from a Celtic word for I swear, Tongu. And there's also in that name, Nabia. And Nabia is a female goddess. And apparently, she's something, the Celtic equivalent of the consort of uh, Jupiter, and also possibly Diana. Now, there are, uh, this is where my Baedeker guide that I recommend to sort of fail me, but there's Roman ruins all over Portugal. And Conan Brigg is one of the, the biggest. It's up in the north. Baths, temples, circus, theater, all that sort of thing. Aqueducts. And this is an image, a uh, mosaic image of Bacchus, the god of wine. And he is obviously a very popular Roman god. And you can see how big this house was. And outside of this house are the Roman ruins in Conebriga. And uh, I think there's baths in this town, too. But there is a museum there. And I want to discuss, just for a few minutes, these dedications. One of them is to Liber. Uh, Father Liber, and it mentions the man who gave it by his own free will, dedicated it. It's sort of an altar stone. Liber was another ancient Roman god of wine, wine culture. And this other one is to Fortuna. And Fortuna, let's see. Yeah, Fortuna is the Roman goddess of luck. So she's popular. Yes, the one in the center is to the so-called lares. These are household gods. You found them in Roman houses all over the empire. And this is to the lares of the waters. Now, Christianity first came to Portugal during the Roman rule, which was around 200-300 BC to um, the 4th century AD. But around the term of, turn of the first century AD, there's a saint who traditionally um, lived at that time named Ovidius of Braga. And uh, he's sometimes depicted he, as here with Episcopal robes, and sometimes he's depicted as a hermit. So go figure on how you put that together. But his Latin name is Auditus, which means he's associated with hearing. And I want to say a little bit about the Catholic, um, it's called the cult of the saints. That doesn't mean they worship saints, but um, venerate them. And my mother always had trouble with that, being a pure Dutch Reformed Calvinist. But they, <laughs> you'll see in Portugal a lot of saints. 
Portugal has had multiple invasions, but at the end of the Roman period, when the Eastern Empire was sort of falling apart, they suffered these uh, Germanic tribes coming in. The Visigoths were in most of the Iberian Peninsula, but you also had these Swaby tribes. And I remember meeting a, a, a friend in Germany, and, and I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Schwaben, you know, Swabia. And it's sort of like saying, where are you from? And instead of saying I'm from the States, you say I'm from Texas. This, there's an old tradition here, and they um, were first Aryans, which means they did not believe that Jesus was the co-eternal son with the Father. Um, eventually, they were converted to more of an orthodox perspective. They did persecute the Jews some, but they were fierce fighters. They lasted until the Arab invasion, or the Moors, as uh, the Europeans call the Arabs. Um, they were a combination of Berbers, which is an old, old native African tribe, set of tribes, and Arab tribes from all over the um, ancient Near East. But they built this castle um, in Abu Fera, um, Perderna Castle, in the 11th century. And it lasted in Arab hands or Moorish hands till uh, 1248, which is about the last year of the occupation. It came in 726 and left in 749. Of course, they didn't think of themselves as occupiers. Um, they thought of themselves as a caliphate. And they, they have left a lot of influences. I don't think you have buildings quite as beautiful as, um, for instance, the Alhambra in Spain. But these um, round houses, uh, white, whitewashed houses with enclosed courtyards, that's one of the memories of the Arabs. And they left um, all kinds of fruits and vegetables and spices that they brought to Portugal. And it's... Uh, set into the language. For instance, the Portuguese albicagro is from the Ar Arabic al-barkuk. Um, carob al-faroba is from the Arabic al-karuba. Orange, laranja in Portuguese, from naranj in Arabic, and pomegranate, roma from ruman. These are all Moorish gifts. And even rice, um, the Portuguese call that Arroz in the Arabic, al rus so um, the culture <coughs> sort of permeates. And of course, uh, they were Islamic. If you do get to Portugal and you're in Lisbon, you might try to find the Moorish Quarter. This is a uh, quarter where apparently there's still some influence architecturally. I looked for an old mosque in Portugal and this was built in the 12th century, and already by the 13th century it became a church. But they didn't destroy, the church um, didn't destroy everything that had been in the original mosque. And this is the mikrab. This is where, um, this is the, the direction towards Mecca that you uh, Muslim prays in five times a day. Islam is a pretty simple religion. You confess that Allah is, is God and there are no others, and that Muhammad is his prophet. I uh, go to Mecca once in a lifetime, fast 30 days a year during Ramadan, and give 2% of your income as a tithe. That's the outside of the mosque. And as you can see, the minaret has been converted into a, a bell tower. The minaret is where, is where the muezzin would call the uh, Muslim faithful to prayer five times a day. And this is another image of it. Now, um, the so-called Reconquista started in the 900s. And what that means is this is where the Christian forces began to force the Moorish forces out of the country. They started in the north and gradually they came down south. But one of the interesting things I found about the whole story there <clears throat> is that in southern Portugal, Christianity was more or less wiped out. And it's still not very religious down there in the south. So I think maybe 
There, but, but nevertheless, there's very few Muslims in the country to this day inside of the building. And as you can see, it's got some, some of these arches that, that show a great deal of Arabic influence. But I remember visiting a mosque in Jerusalem associated with Islam. And my uncle who was there told me that these buildings are so much simpler and beautiful, more beautiful than the Christian churches that are there in the old city. Um, in other words, don't have all the bells and whistles, just a very simple building. This is another, I think, Arabic influence in the country. These are called azulejos in Portuguese, uh, something like alzulaika in Arabic. It's these very beautiful tiles now, this one is, is from the Moorish period. And I just want to show you the white and blue motif that is present in this particular building also in, called the Dome of the Rock, which has been there a very long time. Um, I mean, that's obviously not Portugal, it's Jerusalem, but, but it does have the same white and blue, very beautiful motif. Now, this is what you see in modern Portugal. The um, tiles also were influenced by Italians and by um, Dutch makers. So uh, it's not just Arabic influence. Uh, there's a great deal uh, <laughs> of cultural influences in that country. It's just an amazing place, I think. Um, obviously, this one is from much later than the Moorish period. But it's an image, and this is very Catholic, of the Virgin Mary being crowned Queen of Heaven by the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, this is definitely uh, not something that a Jew or a Muslim would depict, uh, trying to have the face of God there. But it's, uh, I think they're, they're beautiful. This is an image of the resurrection of Lazarus in these sort of tiles. And, um, and the Latin inscription says, um, their brother rises, in other words, Lazarus. I've always enjoyed Romanesque culture, Romanesque architecture. And this church in Ratesh was rebuilt during the 11th and the 12th centuries. It's sort of a heavier architecture than the Gothic. But apparently these Romanesque buildings are all over the country. And this one goes back, part of it, to the Visigothic times. And they even found a Roman stone inside. So maybe the foundation is even Roman. I'm not sure. But it's very ancient. These animals, very Romanesque. And the same thing with this ark. What part of that was the Knights Templars. And the Knights Templars, interesting group, they first came to Portugal in 1128, and a countess gave them this castle, Sur Castle, in 1128. Uh, the Templ Templars lasted for a century until a king of France, Philip IV, decided that he didn't want to pay back his debts to them. <laughs> Instead, uh, he had them um, executed as heretics. He got the pope to go along with that. and. Uh, I guess that means he didn't have to pay back his money. But they did fight. They fought in the Crusades, and they also fought um, with the Arabs. And in 1144, the Knights left this temp uh, castle to go and fight the Arab forces. They lost. Uh, they were taken into slavery, which is what the destiny was uh, at that time, if you lost a battle, you ended up a slave somewhere. But the Templars built a church in Tomar, another town, and they had better luck there against the Arabs, against the Moors, because in 1190, the very caliph of the Arab forces invaded, and the Templars turned him back. But as far as I understand, um, this church is still in use. Fatima is, I think, a place where um, you all are going to go. And we're going to have two different responses to this. 
there's the response of the pilgrim, and that's what I'm going to spend most of the time on, all right? Millions of pilgrims go to this place and appreciate it. By tradition, between the 13th of May to the 13th of October, there were six apparitions of a lady more brilliant than the sun. And the three children who said they saw her, Lucia dos Santos and her cousins Francisco and Jacinto Marto. Um, the two cousins died of the Spanish flu in 1919 and 1920, uh, were made saints um, by the Catholic Church. The sister Lucia lived for a long time and she wrote six memoirs. And in these memoirs, um, she included, and also I think she wrote down some of these documents, three secrets. The first one is a vision of hell. And I guess the, the children saw uh, a vast sea of fire. Uh, unlucky vision, really. The second secret, and here again, this is another side of Catholicism that's hard for people to grasp, Protestants to grasp. But it's a um, recommendation of devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Now, this Immaculate Heart business is a belief that Mary, by the grace of God, um, was uh, kept sinless her whole life. So Mary um, said that she wanted to save souls and bring peace to the world. Her devotion was to, a way to save souls predicted an end of the Great War, since this was right towards the end of World War, II, World War I, but predicted a worse one if people didn't cease offending God, and she asked that Russia be consecrated. Now, Pius XII actually did that in 1952. But the third secret, she's, um, she said, the Holy Father will pass through a city, a big city half in ruins, and with half trembling and halting steps, afflicted with pain and sorrow, he'll see corpses along the way. And then he'll be killed by a group of soldiers who fire bullets and arrows at him. That wasn't revealed by the Vatican until around 2000. Now, that is sort of the pilgrim's experience of Fatima. But Jose Saramago, who is Portugal's Nobel Prize winner for literature, um, had a far different experience. And so for equal time, I'm going to read his. The traveler is a man of opinions. And here his opinion is that aesthetics have failed faith. This is no surprise in our skeptical age. The builders of the most humble of Romanesque chapels knew that they were building the house of God. Nowadays, they are simply carrying out a commission. So you remember that Romanesque chapel I showed you. Um, Saramago liked that sort of thing. The church tower seems undecided how to end, and there's no measure of, or balance in the columns. Only faith can save Fatima, not the beauty it doesn't possess. Well, these pilgrims didn't care about that. <laughs> and they still don't care. The traveler, an unrepentant rationalist, has been moved during this journey by more than one belief he doesn't share and would like to have felt he could respond here to. What he does feel is a certain indignation, pain, and anger faced with a vast number of stalls which are selling by the millions, medallions, rosaries, crucifixions, tiny representations of the shrine, small and large statues of the Virgin. So that's a part of Catholic spirituality that Saramago just could not uh, face. But um, I think he was fascinated by it anyway. Now, the Jews actually had a good deal of influence on the history of Portugal at one time. There's only two pre-expulsion synagogues left in the country. This one is in, at Castel de Vide, and it was built in the 14th century and was used as a synagogue until the expulsion in 1456. In the town, there is a Jewish quarter. It's apparently very beautiful. And this is Saramago again. The traveler cupped his hands and drank and went to the Jewish quarter. 
There the streets mount the steep slopes where the synagogue once stood. And the traveler feels as though he himself were a figure out of a Christmas crib. With all of its little winding steps, its corners and patio walls. The Jewish and our cario quarters are of an incomparable rustic beauty. Their gateways have been preserved with the love and respect that moved the traveler. Their stones are the stones of earlier centuries, some dating back to the 14th century, which previous generations came to love and protect. You find that sort of thing in Europe. But you're not going to find it on a bus. You've got to walk. <laughs> Inside, um, I think they were doing a renovation of the building, and they found the actual Torah shrine from the original synagogue. Now, the Torah shrine is where they kept the scroll of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, in Hebrew, which they would read from in the synagogue every week. The other pre-expulsion synagogue that still exists is in Tomar, although they're both mu uh, used as museums now. This one was built in the early 1400s and lasted as an active synagogue until the expulsion in 1496. But it now has, houses a museum dedicated to Abraham Zakuto, whom I'm going to discuss in, in a minute. Now, this synagogue is obviously modern, but it's in Belmonte. And what's fascinating to me about this Belmonte place is that the Jews went into complete hiding. I mean, they, it, it, super secret. And they intermarried, the families intermarried. I guess there were enough of them. Um, and they lasted until uh, the modern era. I mean, until now, actually. And, <laughs> Only in recent years did they come out of hiding. Um, so uh, and I still would like to see it. Uh, but imagine that much in, um, intermarriage. I, can, I don't think that's healthy. <laughs> I don't know. Someone asked Dr. Cafaro uh, last time about the Inquisition. And, and he did say it was more far worse in Spain, and I, and I think that's true. Um, but there was an inquisition in Portugal. The Jews had been there since the Roman era. And when the Islamic invasion came in 711, um, the Jews were made what's called dhimmis, D-H-I-M-M-I-S. And that is also what the Christians became. And if in a Muslim caliphate, Jews and Christians have to pay the demi tax. But the Jews found that, uh, as far as they were concerned, the, per the persecution was over, that the um, um, other tribes had, had been using. And so it was, uh, for them, it was the time of liberation, despite the fact that they had to pay this tax. Um, but in 1492, when Ferdinand and Isabella conquered Grenada, this is sort of the beginning of the end. And in 1496, I've mentioned this edict of expulsion, which was convert or leave the country without your children. Um, in 1497, there was a forcible conversion, and apparently 2,000 Jews were killed. And some were um, deported to a place called Sao Tome. I'd never heard of this in my life. But it is a, it's an island off the island country. It's actually a country off the coast of Central Africa. And, and to this day, there's still Jews there. So I don't know if they're the direct descendants of these uh, expelled Jews, but they're still there. The Inquisition began in 1536, and it ended formally in 1821. Um, I've had a terrible time trying to find um, accurate numbers. Um, one study mentions 1,175 persons were burned uh, or executed. Another one said something like 40,000. I don't know. I hope it's closer to the lower number. But it somewhat helped matters when John Paul II, Pope John Paul II, apologized for the abuses of the church in 2000. And I think he and the chief rabbi of Rome actually hugged. So it, it, sort of putting away some of these things in the past. 
But the Jews had a great um, number of numerical skills and literary skills, probably because they all are taught to read the Torah, um, girls and boys. And so when they were forced out of Portugal, I think it hurt the economy some. They ended up in places like Amsterdam. So back to the synagogue that is the Abraham Zakuto Museum. Joe talked about Vasco da Gama. Uh, uh, he couldn't have known this. I mean, well, I guess he didn't come across the fact. But Vasco da Gama used an astrolabe made by the, this Abraham Zakuto. And he also used um, his maritime charts and his astronomical charts. Uh, this Zakuto was a brilliant individual. He was also an astrologer, too, of all things. And the first printed book in Portugal was printed by the Jews in 1487. It's called the Pharaoh Pentateuch. This is a, a Torah. And there was a Jew named Isaac of Brabanel who was uh, the treasurer of King Alonso V. So Jews actually had a good deal of cultural influence um, in the country at that time. Jumping ahead several centuries, I want to talk a little bit about the Jewish experience under Antonio Salazar and his new state, which existed from 1932 to 1968. He was an autocrat, but he's a very interesting autocrat. He didn't like fascism, and he certainly hated communism. Um, he was into something called the corporatist state, which means you have representatives from labor, business, military, guilds. They all come together and sort of balance interests. And he based um, his government on some Catholic social principles. Uh, one of the Pope's um, bulls, I call it papal bull, sort of, um, rerum novarum, which is about the right for um, labor unions, I think. He hated anti-Semitism. And he particularly despised the Nuremberg Laws. So even though he made a law that the Jews could not come through Portugal, because they were afraid of the Nazis taking over, could not come through Portugal to escape, nevertheless, somewhere between 100,000 Jews and a million Jews escaped through Salazar's um, Portugal. So. I think that's uh, something very positive to say about his government. Another thing I want to talk about with Salazar is that uh, he was very Catholic. He made some, uh, actually a secret treaty with Pope Pius XII. Um, and I think that still guides uh, Portugal today. So for example, when they build a bridge or uh, certain other structures, um, and this is the state activity. A priest comes and blesses it. So they don't really have a thing about separation of church and state, at least separation of the Roman Catholic Church and the state. And I want to just mention um, something that I learned um, from, it was in South Carolina, uh, where my, some of my family lives. I met a man who was born here, but his parents are both from Portugal. And I was asking him, about, actually at a golf course where he worked, and I was asking him about, about his country, and, and he said, well, when he goes into the small villages, this is where his family lives, that you see um, these elderly women or, or women in all black, and they go to mass every day. And 80% of the country identifies as Catholic, but the actual attendance of mass is much slower. But in the villages, it's very high. And he said you can be um, driving down the road if you see a picnic table in someone's yard. You can actually stop because it might be a restaurant. Um, so you know, that's his, his many experience of the country. But I just thought that's interesting because the village life is where you see sort of people um, they're not so used to tourists. And 
I think that may be true sort of all over the Mediterranean world. I don't know how this music really fits in to Portuguese spirituality, but I'm going to play a song anyway. Um, I talked to a former colleague here uh, who's from Brazil, and of course she speaks Portuguese fluently. And she told me that this is one of the most popular forms of music in the entire country, fado music. Apparently it's an untranslatable word, but people say that it means sung sadness. And I think, you know, if people might be Christian at heart, but yet this is where their experience of life is. And so, Lisbon, city of the ages, full of charm and beauty, always beautiful with a smile and not always in casual dress. The white veil of yearning clings to your face, beautiful princess. Look, gentlemen, at this Lisbon from other times, of the crusaders, the expectations, and the royal bullfights, of festivals, secular processions, of the popular morning auctions that will never come back. Lisbon of gold and silver, another more beautiful I don't see, forever singing and dancing gladly. Your countenance is portrayed in the crystal blue of the Tagus. Look, gentlemen, at this Lisbon from other times, of the Crusaders, the expectations, and the royal bullfights of festivals. That was Herminia Silva. Obviously, she's one of the popular ones there. I've got one last slide. If you're in a village and you run across a family that has either seven or nine children, you need to be careful because that seventh child or that ninth child may be a war wolf. <laughs> and, and this is folk religion, so I, I thought I shouldn't leave out folk religion. Uh, this, there's a poem here and a song that you can read yourselves, and I'm not quite sure about some of these words. I'm, I'm hoping they're not obscenities, but um, <laughs> if, if you go, you can find out. You are the one of whom Jesus said, I appreciate being made a man. I don't quite get that one. But apparently there's a lot of sort of superstition. And one of the um, superstitions, another superstition is the evil eye. And evil eye is something you hear all over the Mediterranean. Um, I was in England my junior year and, I, and we had about a month off for spring break and I hitchhiked all over. And I got a ride with a gypsy, but he told me he couldn't bring me home because his grandmother might put the evil eye on me. And I, I, did, I appreciated that because I didn't want to deal with the evil eye. But you know, you hear about this evil eye. Um, and I read about one on Reddit, actually, um, of a small village in Portugal where there's a woman and the, there's just the people are lined up outside her door. She's sort of a witch, but seer. Um, and they'll ask her about their lives and, and what to do. Um, sort of like some of the folks we've had around here. I won't call any names, but they've, <laughs> they've got storefronts, um, psychics. Anyway, that's what I have for religions in Portugal. If you've got any questions, I'll attempt to.